the hall technique, um, what the evidence is so far, how you can actually apply it, um, and in, in which situations it's good, it's useful to apply, and what the impact of the hall technique might be, both personally and um, and for the community and and families. Um, and in terms of the themes of today. Um, it really fits in very nicely, I think, into the themes because the hall technique actually um, assists in the prevention of the progression of caries and the prevention of new caries on other surfaces of those particular teeth that the crown's placed on. It uh, falls under the promotion um, area as well in that it allows early intervention in the caries process. Um, it promotes oral health education by interacting with, with families at an early, early point, and it also promotes good relationships with, with us as oral health providers because it's a non-invasive technique, minimal intervention dentistry technique. It also fits under preservation very well too um, in terms of preserving the tooth for as long as it should remain in the arch and um, preserving that, that space. Um, in order to preserve the developing dentition as well. So um, you may remember this man. He came to talk to you last year um, at a Dota Q last year. He's my boss and uh, my other wonderful mentor in life um, and work, and his name's Hanny Kalash. And um, he's the principal investigator of the research that's been happening in Victoria around the hall technique. He's pictured here with... Um, a, a young four-year-old girl called Arche, not her real name, who came in as part of our pilot project into our dental clinic. Now, Arche had never been to the dentist before. She's from an African country. Um, never been to the dentist. Came in with her. Her mother didn't quite... was very cautious, very anxious, didn't really want to partake. Um, but we managed to get one bite wing on one side, OK? So we managed to get one bite wing and offered for her to have a Hall Technique crown. So a Hall Technique crown was placed on the upper D there at the same visit. Next visit, she came along, skipped in happily, sat in the chair and allowed the bite wing to be done on the other side and treatment progressed. So I just wanted to sort of start off with this as a little story in terms of... Um, giving an example of how a child who's never had an experience before didn't have to have a drill picked up, didn't have to have an anaesthetic, was able to just have um, a crown placed and felt quite comfortable about it. We'll go into this in a lot more detail. Now, you're going to have a lot of questions um, and I'm going to try and answer them today in this presentation, but there'll be time, uh, if there's not time at the end, there'll be time at lunchtime or I'm here for the day, so please come and talk to me. I've also got um, quite a few journal articles that I'm going to make available. I think they're going to make them available on the website, which has a lot of the um, evidence that I'll be talking about here um, from overseas and, and yeah, some really interesting articles that you'll be able to read um, about the whole technique. Um, so, yeah, so what's the evidence? Some of these questions we're going to look at. When can I use it? How should I use it? Um, how can I help improve the experience for my patients? And what are the implications for my patients and their families? And what are we looking at with this research in Australia? And, and what do clinicians also think about it? OK, so firstly, what is the whole technique? Now, I think um, Hanny introduced it to you last year. Um, but for those of you who weren't here, it's um, a technique which is a minimal intervention dentistry technique. It involves the management of carious or hyperplastic primary molars using stainless steel crowns without picking up a drill, without, pick, uh, without having to use analgesia. So there's no crown reduction. It's simply um, a matter of carefully selecting via radiography and um, your clinical diagnosis, carefully selecting the tooth and cementing the tooth, sizing up the crown, and we'll go into that in more detail, cementing the tooth um, with uh, glycinoma cement. It's, it really does require very good clinical judgment, though, and, and it really is necessary to have radiography 
for it. So um, we know that about um, 10 to 30 per cent of children um, are going to present with care as primary molars, and in some of your practices, you'll be seeing a much higher percentage. Um, these children are often candidates for general anaesthesia, and, and Chris was talking about how there's very high rates of general anaesthesia still. Um, so if, if we can get in there early before these teeth are symptomatic and put good seals on these teeth, we can seal decay and we can um, preserve the tooth. So some of the things that the Hall Technique has the potential to do are in very, very importantly to improve treatment compliance in young children. And this is something that we've been, that we're measuring and looking at in our, in our study. And to reduce the anxiety that's associated with dental treatment that you all will be dealing with daily. Um, in Victoria, our data tells us that we, that stainless steel crowns are used in three to four percent of children where they would have, should have been used. And most of those stainless steel crowns have been put on under general anaesthetic. So we know that people are reluctant to use stainless steel crowns and there are, are many reasons, but obviously it's, it requires a lot of um, cooperation from the child with using anaesthesia and, and drills, etc. So the Hall technique has the potential to avoid the negative um, health impacts and the cost of repeat treatment also, and I'll be talking a bit more about that evidence, um, and to reduce uh, tooth extractions and, and more extensive treatment. And so importantly, in conjunction with um, a preventive approach, MID approach, we think that it can reduce hospital admissions. Okay, so why do we need another approach? Well, we know that caries rates aren't reducing. They're still, they're actually going up. Um, and avoidable hospitalisations for dental care are a very large cost burden on the community. Um, so we know that care is reduced from 1977 and sort of reduced down to about 1996, but since then it's been increasing. And in 2010, 48% of five-year-olds and 63% of nine-year-olds visiting a school dental service had decay of missing or filled. Um, the 10% of uh, four to six-year-old children with the most extensive history of tooth decay have more than nine DMFT. I've put in the most updated um, caries figures that we've got, but the National Child Oral Health Survey figures aren't completely out yet. And when it comes to ambulatory care sensitive conditions, we mean the medical problems that are preventable and that can be treated outside of hospital. So we're talking about dental care that could have been treated in the chair. So you can see here the, hu oops, sorry, the huge numbers of um, zero to four year olds and five to nine year olds in Victoria. And these are the, these are the sort of the last figures we've got, 2008, 2009. In 2009-10, dental treatment was the third most common cause of hospitalisation in Australia. And in 2012-13, in Victoria, it was the second most common cause after asthma with a total of 4,700 admissions, an average bed, bed stay of one, just over one bed day. But in five to 14 year olds in Victoria, it's the number one cause of, of um, hospital admissions right now. And the average cost of admissions is two and a half thousand dollars and rising. So there's a huge cost which is avoidable. And I think um, it's, it's quite stark when you look at it like that. So, moving on, um, of course, this out of necessity comes creativity because this, is, this was where uh, the Hall technique was really discovered. In Scotland, there was a dentist, a general dentist, who was in a remote area, and her name was Dr Norna Hall, and by um, accident, or by accident of audit, it was found that she was doing an extraordinary number of stainless steel crowns. She was doing, she'd done around um, 1,000 crowns on 300 children or so. Um, and so 
they looked carefully at what she was doing and found that she was, she was using stainless steel crowns to just treat and seal caries. She wasn't removing any caries, she wasn't cutting into the teeth, and she was doing it because she didn't have any referral pathways. She had not very little access to um, general anaesthetics and she just had, you know, hundreds of children coming in. So she, it was out of necessity, essentially. So there was um, a retrospective analysis done of her, of her practice and her records, and Nicola Innes and Daffod Evans, who are in, at the University of Dundee in, in the UK, have done this seminal work around, around the whole technique. So they started by doing a pilot, start looking at her records and finding that um, essentially there was a very good outcome for those teeth that had, um, that had, been, had the crowns on them, that, that it was equivalent or better than those than teeth that would have had just normal restorations on. So, um, I'm just going to show you now a slide of what the key findings of their studies were. So the first, their study um, up the top here, let's see if I can get this pointer working, um, Innes and Evans, so Nicola Innes and Daffod Evans and group um, did a randomised controlled split mouth study where they found that at the end of three years, um, com so conventional restoration on one side of the mouth, whole technique restoration on the other side of the mouth. The conventional restorations, there were 56% um, minor failures and 19% major failures, so that's abscesses, irreversible pulpitis, unable to restore, etc. Compared to the whole technique crowns in the same, same mouth, other side of the mouth, same tooth, 3% major failures and 6% minor failures. That's for 132 children. So this is quite extraordinary. Um, and also they looked at the preference, they looked at a number of things, but they looked at the preference for the whole technique over conventional restorations and that was quite astounding too, that 77% of children, 83% of carers, 81% clinicians preferred the use of the whole technique. Um, now, Dorothy Boyd and Lindy Foster Page over in New Zealand have done some work around the whole technique as well and they've done some very good work and particularly looking at um, anxiety as well. They trained um, 10 uh, dental therapists to place whole technique crowns and they placed them on uh, 190 children, sorry, they split 190 children into two groups. Around 100 of them had whole technique crowns and the rest of them had conventional treatment. And they found that 90% of the kids having the whole technique crowns enjoyed their visits compared to 52%. Um, after six months, they found that there were twice as many dental abscesses amongst those who'd had conventional treatment than um, compared to those that had the whole technique treatment and nearly three times as many replacement fillings in six months. Um, and on average, um, it took uh, <coughs> 20 minutes less to place a whole technique crown. Okay, now, what um, I've uh, been in contact with Dorothy and, and Lindy and we've talked quite a bit about radiographic quality and this is, this is something that comes up again and again. It's, the, it's essential to have really good radiographs to be able to do this technique because you really need to be able to assess where the, where the um, care is, has extended to. So some of the concerns that um, have been expressed around the whole technique are a number. Uh, there's three of them, in fact. First being that sealing in caries can be um, a concern uh, with the possible outcomes of necrosis and um, abscess formation. Um, also the fact that it does increase the occlusal vertical dimension slightly because you're not reducing the um, occlusal table. And another one is the possibility of impaction of erupting sixes. Okay, so I'll just um, th now I'll just address those concerns because there is definitely an awful lot of evidence that we've had over the last 20 years around sealing caries. Um, we've got the Fisher sealant studies. We've got we've seen that stepwise excavation um, techniques, both two-step or single-step and indirect pulp capping, um, there's no adverse effects after 10 years when caries is being sealed. And there's a, um, a systematic review study which is also around this, this same result. Um, and then we also have the whole technique studies. So all these studies are going to be made available to you, like I said. 
So we can, um, with the uh, concern about increasing the occlusal vertical dimension, the studies that have been done in the Hall technique have shown, the Innocent Evans studies have shown that it does revert back to normal, it re-establishes back to normal within a few weeks. Um, there was a study by Van der Zee and Van Amerongen, um, and they found that after 15 to 30 days, the occlusion re-established. We're not quite sure what happens, whether the tooth actually um, submerges slightly or whether, and this is being looked at in more detail by Innes and Evans and their group. Um, but uh, we found ourselves, our results in our pilot study, that where uh, occlusal vertical dimension increased and only by one or two millimetres, and in a very small number of children, it had definitely returned to baseline um, at 30 days. So there's some answers to that concern. And then with the impacting erupting permanent molar, um, essentially the likelihood will be the same as a conventional um, hall technique, uh, sorry, a conventional stainless steel crown placement. It's um, it, probably around 1% and it can be well easily managed by using uh, separating rings or and making sure that the crown is, is a well-fitting crown. So I'll just now move on to uh, some of the work that we did um, into just looking into the acceptability of the Hall technique amongst um, uh, preschool children, their carers and public oral health practitioners. Um, and also just to look at the success of the Hall technique used to manage carious lesions. So we did this, this pilot study in 2012. Um, in Victoria and in, in partnership with one of the community agencies, North Richmond. Um, we looked at primary molars affected by carious lesions where the caries was in the outer half of dentine and um, in, in three to five year old children who are at high risk. And we evaluated the acceptability through questionnaires and interviews. We we actually didn't ask the children directly uh, in this study. We did in the next study, so we used the parents as proxies in this study. Um, so our case selection was um, we were to choose one or two primary molars with caries in the outer half of dentine, and this is an example of a radiograph from one of our children. Importantly, no pulpal symptoms and no pathology on the radiograph, so only caries, sorry, only caries, and caries needed to be within the outer half of dentine, okay? So you could actually choose any of these teeth here. We used the IC-DAS too, and we got clinicians, asked clinicians, to code every surface of every tooth <coughs> for the children, which wasn't actually successful, so we've not used that in the second phase of the trial because it was a very big ask. And we trained dentists, and we only trained dentists to start with, and we calibrated uh, them in the ICDAS and, um, and diagnosis. So, in general, contraindications for the Hall technique are any signs or symptoms of irreversible pulpitis or dental abscess, any clinical or radiographic signs of pulpal exposure, or any periridicular pathology. So, you really need to get a radiograph that has, um, you can see the furcation area in. If you can't see the furcation area, then it's, it's not a good idea to be doing it. Um, you wouldn't use it in a tooth where the crown's so broken down that you wouldn't normally be able to restore it with a, um, you know, with a conventional technique. Um, and the caries just shouldn't extend beyond the middle two-thirds of dentine. There must be a band of dentine between the advancing caries and the pulp horns. So that you need to see a visible band. This is the way the um, UK people teach the technique. You must see a visible band. For our purposes, we've said don't go beyond the middle third of dentine. It just makes it clearer. Um, so you sort of, you look and you do a, this isn't a good example, but you would do a, where's the caries begun, the beginning point, and then you'd sort of measure down towards the pulp horn. So the technique, and these sl next slides are all courtesy of Nicola um, Innocent Dafford Evans from the UK, who've been very, very 
very, very supportive of, of our work and allowed us to um, do some of our training by using their photos and their, their uh, um, published technique. Um, so you would firstly trial the, the stainless steel crown. So what you need to do is you need to find the right size and that's, that can be the tricky thing. You generally get out your three middle four, five, six sizes and put them on the tray, know where they are, test them for size. If you get um, spring back, then you know that you've, you've got about the right size. You can just gently push it down and, and, it, and it pops back. So you might need to use um, separators and uh, we've used them quite a lot in our study um, and it does make them much easier. It just depends on the stage of the dentition. With the very younger children, you don't necessarily need to use them. Um, so you find the right size. Um, so, it, so there needs to be that filling of spring back. You fill the stainless steel crown with a glass ion of eluting cement um, and you locate it on top of the tooth and you push it down but you actually you sorry you don't you gently put finger pressure on it and put it into place but you ask the child to bite down on the crown so it's very much the child is involved so you're talking the child through the child's involved um, and the child but so the child bites down and then you wipe off the excess cement and then you ask the child to bite down again. So it's a two-step process of the child biting down firmly on, on the crown. And then you check and you clean it. And there you have it. Quite simple. No preparation at all. No drill, no need to remove any decay. There shouldn't be any impacted food around. And the tooth should be, you know, just dry-ish, dry enough. But you don't need any, any caries removal. As long as you have diagnosed this accurately, You've got a radiograph that shows that it doesn't go beyond the middle two thirds and there's a clear band of dentine and there's no pathology. The child is not in pain from that tooth. That's, you can go ahead. The separators can be left in, depending on the child, they can be left in from anywhere up to a couple of hours to a couple of days, or three days. I wouldn't leave them in much longer, they tend to drop out. Yep. So we've had kids coming in in the morning popped in separators, got them back in the afternoon. Yep. Okay, and it takes not long to put in a separator. We haven't needed to use a lot of crimping, but yeah, that, that can be done. Yep. So, um, so just, yeah, I don't really probably need to reiterate it, but we're looking at um, primary molars with decay in the outer two thirds. Um, no pulpal symptoms, and I just can't emphasise enough good radiography, and this is the challenge, is getting good radiography, isn't it? <laughs> and making sure that we take radiographs too, because I know the UK people are telling us that in their practices, they've got a huge trial going on there called the Fiction Trial, which is um, involving hundreds of children, and it's assessing biological and preventive approach to childhood decay in three to seven year olds versus the restorative approach. And they're saying that in their practices that have, that use more radiography, they're finding more decay. Okay, so these, these are some of the areas that you might actually find could be useful for uh, some of the situations you might find useful for using the whole technique. And definitely with hyperplastic teeth, um, for a caries control, and um, in your remote rural context, now I've said there are no radiography available, but th that's um, looking into the future. And one of the things that we're hoping that we'll be able to do with the research eventually is to show that with a certain level of, of caries clinically, we'll have a we'll know how far it's gone radiographically. But you know, but that's that's in the future. And look, as a caries control in a remote rural context, with no radiography, well, you do what you can. So just moving on to what we found in our pilot study, um, we placed 22 whole technique crowns on 14 children, so a very small sample. The average time of the procedure was five and a half minutes. And that's from testing the size of the crown right through to final set, um, finishing off the, clearing off the cement. Okay, so we thought that was pretty good. Um, and like I said, where the um, occlusal vertical dimension increased, it, it um, reduced back to baseline by 30 days. Um, 
We also had clinicians reporting that it was a much easier procedure to perform than their normal restorative techniques. Really positive behaviour for all children who had the whole technique crowns, and the children themselves generally experienced no discomfort or little discomfort. Um, and the com those comfort levels correlated with what the parents were saying about how they felt their children's children were responding. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples now from that pilot study of radiographs, and this is where I think you'll find it very um, instructional. So this was a um, a, a four-year-old child who at baseline um, had a radiograph and the 7.5, you can see there, uh, with the caries there, had the whole technique crown placed on it. And you can see the whole technique crown here. At 21 months, the child was finally, finally came back to see us. It was a very erratic attender. Um, and it, the child was meant to be seen at 12 months, but just couldn't get them back in, fell into a tent, etc. Got them in 21 months, looking great, looking great. But the tooth next to it, okay, so the tooth next to it had decay in the occlusal that was restored at some point, but it had this very, very early lesion there, and look what's happened there. Okay, so the next example, three-year-old child, the tooth six four, had the um, whole technique crown placed on it. She came back 15 months later after a number of, of failures to attend. Um, so we're talking about a community that's a cold community um, and there are, you know, there are some issues around attendance and movement so it can be very difficult to get them back. Um, but again, you can see that there's been this progression of caries and another tooth. So if you're not taking, up the, taking those follow-up um, radiographs, you won't be picking up these sorts of things. The reason why I'm showing these examples too is because it will start to point us towards thinking about placing hall technique crowns on teeth that have got early decay. Now, this last example I'm going to show you is quite, um, it's a fantastic um, slide. It's of a child that had two hall technique crowns in our pilot study, and the crowns were on the 8-4 and the 6-4. I've got them up there. Um, the child eventually came back in at 17 months, which wasn't too bad, five months after they were meant to come in, and they said to us, oh, the crowns have come off. Okay, so that was, sorry, that's the 8-4 where we put a whole technique crown and the 6-4 where we put a whole technique crown on. Okay, so the crowns had come off at 17 months. If you look there at the 8-4, you can see that there's actually been no progression of caries. If you look at the 6-4, there's also been no progression of caries. But if you look back at the baseline radiograph of the 8-5, and then you look 17 months post-placement, you can see progression of caries. And that tooth had no treatment. So what this is saying to us is, we are actually able to arrest the progression of caries by sealing caries. A good seal. Yes, sure, the crown came off, but that's okay. That happens. We've been able to arrest caries in those two teeth. Going back to the question about could you put them on all teeth, um, you could conceivably put them on all teeth. You do need to be a bit careful about occlusal vertical dimension increases, so you would want to be putting them on contralateral teeth to start with and then leaving it for 30 days or so, contralateral teeth, and then putting them next to each other is another slight issue and you need to be waiting a few weeks for that too. But basically over a space of around three months you could probably, I mean just off the cuff, you could probably put eight whole technique crowns on and go well over your Medicare benefit schedule for the child. <laughs> Overall with our pilot study, of those 22 
crowns, I've shown you two that came off that could be replaced. Unfortunately, the child didn't have them replaced because they were moving right out of the area and they couldn't, didn't want to continue in the study, but they... Um, and then there was another crown that came off at 10 months and that was replaced too, and that actually, um, as I recall it, perforated. So, yeah. So these are early findings that we haven't published yet, but, it's, they're, but they're very instructional. And what we really found from this study was a number of things that helped us then put together um, a plan to do a bigger study, and, and that's what we're doing at the moment. Um, the next slide is just showing you what we consider as minor and major failures. Um, and essentially, a, a major failure will be the abscess or um, an interradicular radiolucency. We do find, though, uh, and it's, um, you know, our, our colleagues overseas have said if, you, if it's going to fail, you'll see that it fails clinically more likely than seeing it radiographically first. Um, they've only found one radiographic failure that they didn't find clinically, so that's quite interesting. Um, and in terms of minor failures, things like um, the crown wearing through or splitting or being lost in the tooth restorable, um, caries around the margin or the first permanent molar impacting or reversible pulpitis that's able to be treated without pulp therapy, they're the sort of things that we're considering as, as minor failures. Okay. So, in our second phase of the research, uh, we've, we're aiming to look at the success of the technique in three to seven year old children and its acceptability to those children and the carers and the dental staff. And also looking at the cost effectiveness of the technique. And, you know, that's, that's not always something that can be done easily and we're, doing, we're going to be doing this in a number of ways. So we, where in the pilot study we said we're only taking um, teeth that have caries up to the middle to the halfway point through dentine, we've been bolder and we've said, right, let's go to that, that um, middle third. Um, we've trained mainly dental and oral health therapists who have, they have just been fantastic people to work with. And I, I'll show you, a, there's a photo of a couple of them that I'll come to, but they are really such champions for this technique and there's 12 of them out there down in Victoria who are doing this. Um, and so we've included more agencies and so possibility of many more young people. And in our training, we've offered CPD, we've offered CPD to all clinicians at all the agencies just to know, to find out about the whole technique. And what we've used is a facial image scale to be able to assess, it's a validated tool for young children as young as three to be able to assess uh, how they feel about the, about the technique. Um, so some of our results are here. This is just how many um, how many uh, placements were made at each agency. And this agency, Monash, who placed the most, they have a huge, they're an outer urban area of Melbourne with an enormous migrant population. Um, and yeah, we had one clinician um, who placed 53 whole technique crowns. She loves it so much. <laughs> she just... <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and North Richmond is, uh, has very small numbers of children. They're the agency that we did the pilot study at and we, the pilot study really, we were only able to gather small numbers and so we knew that we had to go to some uh, agencies that had much bigger numbers. Barwon is the Geelong region um, and so we've got a lot of rural areas and they've only had fluoride in the water for since 2010, I think it is. Um, so the cultural background of the children, um, over half of them Australian, but from many other countries. Um, those 22 Afghan children were all Rosalie's um, patients at, out at Monash. Um, and yeah, plenty from, from other areas, including the um, African countries too. So there's three of our clinicians from Monash, and that's Rosalie in the middle, who's... Um, just, she loves it. She's done the 53. Anne-Marie works with her and she is a fantastic <coughs> organiser and has got everyone working really well and, and um, makes make sure all the supplies are there, etc. And Angela is the one dentist that's been trained and she loves it too and she's um, taken some fabulous photographs which she's given us to use as well. Um, so some of the things that clinicians are saying about the technique. I love this Whole technique on my patients, the best thing was their response and the reaction of the children. Loved it, I felt so enthusiastic about it. I found it transforms children. They come in very anxious, 
One little boy said, you're the best dentist. You don't need to drill and fill. What have we been doing all these years? Um, it's converted me. I was hesitant initially, leaving carries behind. Due to 30 years of practice removing carries, I was concerned, but I wanted to be open-minded, so I read through the literature, attended the training, was a little hesitant, but after the first was placed, I felt such a sense of achievement. Saw the benefits to the patient, ease of application, comfort, minimal time. Patients and parents very pleased. Crowns look good and clean. I know the crown tooth will be there till it exfoliates and the patient will not have to come back and have a filling redone on that tooth. So this is what the clinicians are saying. <laughs> they love it. OK. It doesn't mean that we haven't had downsides of it too. I mean, just yesterday I had an email, look, this child's come in, the crown had actually come off two weeks after it was placed. The child comes in nine months later, <laughs> tooth is barely restorable. We're not quite sure, we're not quite sure what's happening there. But, um, but the child was booked to come, was told, come back in January, didn't turn up. So, you know, you, you can't do it all. <laughs> you just... So, uh, distribution of age. We've got 23-year-olds and obviously, you know, mainly fives and six-year-olds, five and six-year-old kids in the in the study, and that's just showing the distribution throughout the, um, the clinics. Uh, interesting tooth type, receiving the Hall Technique crown. The majority um, of them are second molars, so the green and the purple, the second molars, um, with uh, lower first molars. A, a bit of a reluctance to do upper first molars because the clinicians were given a choice. Uh, as to which, in, and, you, and obviously you'd know that in these children there's a number of teeth that can be, we're not just seeing one tooth come in that needs, a, it's got a hole in it, we're seeing a number. So they'd choose and there's, there's always a bit of an issue with trying to get an upper D stainless steel crown on, so they would choose the easier ones. So. Mm. Anyway, uh, so um, What's interesting is that as time went on over our recruitment phase, and we only spent six months placing 251 crowns on 251 children, the actual time for placement um, reduced. So more and more placements took less than six minutes to place. There's obviously some difficult ones and you know, tricky ones, but essentially, it started, the time started to reduce. Okay, so that was good to see. Uh, now, separators. Separators were used quite a lot. I actually didn't expect that we, they would be used a lot because we didn't, we hardly used them in the pilot study, but we had younger children in the pilot study too. So doing six, seven year olds, um, that was, yeah, they were used quite a bit. So. What we looked, we asked the clinicians what, how they thought the children accepted separators because actually having separators can be a little bit uncomfortable, you know. And in fact, some of the kids found it more uncomfortable, I think, than actually having the crown put on. So, um, and I know my own children, when they've had orthodontic separators put in for orthodontics, I'm <laughs> handing out the Panadol. And, you know, they've really, I mean, they've probably got low pain thresholds, but... <laughs> Um, anyway, so you can see from this that generally around 90% of children um, had no apparent discomfort or mild or trivial, so it's pretty good. Now, in terms of parent and carer acceptability, from the pilot study we found that there were a number of themes that parents were, were coming up with, So, because we looked at a, a lot of their comments and we themed them into it being pain-free, quick and easy, no need for an anaesthetic, no drill, and that the child can feel a sense of achievement. Okay, and that's a really valuable thing too, that feeling of sense of achievement, showing everyone proudly, you know, their crown at school. And there was a story of one child who, who um, was showing their friend at kinder and the, kinder and the child came home and said, I want one too. And they were actually going to the dentist and came in. And <laughs> yeah. So in terms of uh, our pilot study and the satisfaction and acceptability found in the pilot study, we've... Um, we've given the parents and carers a, a um, questionnaire and one of the questions being, I think the silver crown will do a good job at protecting my child's tooth and um, there's great agreement around that, as you can see from that um, chart. And then I will be happy for my child to have this treatment using silver crowns in the future, tended to also be very happy about that. 
um, and in terms of their accept the, the parents' perception of the child's acceptance, and we're going to be doing further analysis which will look at how that may uh, correlate with the child's actual acceptance. But parents, as you can see, all the blue there in, the, in that pie graph is uh, agreement on, on uh, it, the fact that the child coped well with having the silver crown put on, with just a very small percentage, um, either neutral or not, not that well. Um, and some of, the, some of the parent comments are there. Um, this kind of treatment is painless, not scary for young children to undergo. Okay, so this is just a little picture of how we got the children to give us responses. So we used that facial image scale and um, one of the uh, um, DAs came up with the idea that we should give it to them to actually mark with a white mark, whiteboard marker. So it's a, um, it's a laminated piece so they would, you know, we, the DA would ask questions and they would give their response. Um, and some of the quotes from the children were, you know, it's cool, it looks good, um, you know, and they want to show their friends at school, etc. Um, so that's the, the faces that, um, and they're, they're a bit sort of odd, aren't they? But that's, that's, that's how, um, the, it, that, that's the actual scale that was, um, has been validated. Um, but, uh, yeah, so in terms of asking the children, how do you feel we looked after you today? Generally, and when you look at all the age groups, the majority were smiley, very smiley. And we've, we've, we've actually looked at the three-year-old age group and um, a bit more closely and there wasn't, there wasn't much unhappiness there. The, the ones that were a little bit more, um, a few more of them showed a little bit of unhappiness was the five-year-olds. Okay, so just a... Um, some one here. Uh, so... What, we, what I've just done here is just to show you in general, I've kept the neutral response to how did you feel when you had your silver tooth put on, the children, just kept the neutral response out there, but put the ones and the twos together. And you can see that it's around 60 to 70% happiness, feeling reasonably happy about when they had the tooth put on. And um, four to, uh, fours and fives together, mm, three-year-olds, bit higher there, but um, around the 20% together. Okay, so just an, uh, an example of someone from our study. And like I said, we could put a, um, a separator on at 9.45 in the morning. Um, on, this was a carious and hyperplastic tooth. Five, and then at 3.30 the child came back and the crown was placed in four to six minutes. And the patient was very happy about, the, they had a very smiley face about how they felt about how they were treated, how they um, felt when the silver tooth was put on, and the parents strongly agreed they'd be happy to have the treatment in the future. So, and since the placement of that core technique crown, all the other hyperplastic second primary molars have had three surface glass ionomers put on them. And we're going to be looking at, we're going to be following a matched tooth from every child who's had a whole technique crown. So we're going to be following the uh, same tooth in the same arch and following them through for the length of study and, and that will be part of our cost effectiveness um, analysis as well. Um, just a little story about a girl that came in to see, who went to visit her local private dentist who said, oh, you know, there's too much going on here, you've got to go to a paediatric dentist. Send her to a paediatric dentist who said, oh, I've got to put four stainless steel crowns on under general anaesthesia. Her mother was, oh, I don't know about this general anaesthetic business, I'm really not happy about it, so she did a little bit of research. We'd had a lot of media um, coverage over the pilot time of the pilot study, and um, she managed to find some of that, chased down the principal investigator, Hanny, rang Hanny, and Hanny said, look, go along to North Richmond and just get assessed. Um, and she turned out to be um, eligible for the study, came along and um, had a crown fitted, um, <coughs> one crown fitted. She had some fluoride varnish on her other um, hypoplastic primary molars. And her response, she didn't like biting down on the tooth and she hated the taste of the cement. But according to her mother, this was a far better outcome than a general anaesthetic. 
So that's just one example of a child that's been spared an unnecessary anaesthetic. Um, the cement can taste a bit vinegary and, yeah, so some of the kids don't, but that's the same for all GIs. <coughs> Um, so, might be finishing on time. <laughs> what do we think? Does it fit under prevention? I think it does. I think, I think we've seen and I've shown that it can, it can stop the progression of caries. Um, there's more work to be done, obviously. Um, we need more evidence, but even as a caries control measure, um, it's worth thinking about. It's available to us all to do. Um, and it's certainly, uh, if it stays there, it will prevent further caries on other surfaces, which would cost more money and more treatment. Um, in terms of promotion, um, we can see that if we can get in there early and we can give the children a really good um, experience, we can really help uh, their relationships with healthcare and with Future, future treatment needs. And um, if we can get it to stay there until it's foliation, then we've preserved that tooth in the arch and we've saved it from further, further treatment. But there's another P, and maybe you'll all be a part of it, and you already are all a part of it anyway, and it's called a paradigm shift. And it's about shifting our, our treatment and our attitude and the public's attitude towards dental caries, decay. We can heal it, we don't have to cut it out, we don't have to intervene in a surgical manner, we don't have to destroy, we can heal it. So I think that's a really important message and I think that's um, where it, what Chris is talking about is, is um, it all sort of comes together in that it's a really great opportunity to be talking to people about the the approach that and the understanding that they have about decay. <laughs>